what could be so important about a traffic stop that the case went all the way to the Supreme Court? We'll look at that next on the Constitution Study. Every day we're everyday Americans Hold our own and call it home Put it all on a little piece of land Pay the bills, stay out of jail Love the neighbors and have a few good friends Every day we're everyday Americans Hello there again, Everyday Americans. Paul Engel here with The Constitution, where we read and study the Constitution and teach the rising generation to be free. I am so glad you could join me today. As always, head over to the website, constitutionstudy.com. There's a lot of new stuff coming out soon. I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you give me some feedback on it. I hope you share these videos, the articles, anything you find with friends and family so that we all can learn a bit more about what the Constitution actually says so we can all become better citizens of the United States of America. Now, I want to thank everybody that does share that. I want to thank everybody that's going to head over to the new store that will be coming up uh, pretty soon. Uh, my, sh my goal is to have it released December 1st. I want to thank everybody, though, that's also inviting me to come speak to their groups. I'm having a great time engaging with people face to face. Uh, my, there, there's going to see some changes in the live stream. There's going to be some really cool things. If you would like to have me speak to one of your groups, either in person or over the web, go to the website. You'll find a button there to request that I speak to your group and you can fill out a little form and give me some information. I'd be more than happy to discuss that with you. With that, let's talk about this traffic stop. Oral arguments for this case were heard uh, early November. Now, to understand why this case went all the way to the Supreme Court, we should start with why Oklahoma and 16 other states filed an amicus brief before the court. Quote, This case involves a challenge to the constitutionality of a useful practice of state law enforcement officers stopping motor vehicles known to be registered to individuals with suspended licenses, or having outstanding war arrest warrants to verify whether the driver is committing or has committed a crime. Now a little background. When a Kansas Sheriff's deputy checked the registration of a 1995 Chevrolet pickup truck, he found that the registered owner, a Mr. Charles Glover, had a suspended driver's license. He then pulled the vehicle over and found Mr. Glover driving. Now, now, during a hearing, the state of Kansas stipulated that the deputy did not observe any traffic infractions and did not attempt to identify the driver of the truck before pulling him over. Mr. Glover argues that the stop violated his rights protected by the Fourth Amendment since it was based solely on the deputy's suspicion that he was driving the vehicle without any attempt to identify the driver. It was therefore an unreasonable stop. Now, several Kansas courts, including the Supreme Court, agreed with Mr. Glover. The state of Kansas has appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States to have the opinion of their own state courts overturned. So why did 17 states file a brief in support of the state of Kansas? Well, from their own brief, quote, the decision below undermines the ability of state officers to keep their streets safe. This jeopardizes the lives of lawful drivers, passengers, and pedestrians everywhere. Accordingly, amici states have a substantial interest in this court's disposition of the case. This case brings several interesting constitutional questions to light. The first is one I've raised before. What is reasonable? See, that's at the heart of the question before the court. Is it reasonable to stop someone because the owner of the car is not licensed to operate it? The attorneys for the state of Kansas and for the United States say, yes. Your Honor, we're asking the court to hold that as a general matter, as a matter of common sense and ordinary human experience, the owner of the vehicle is very often the driver of that vehicle in the absence of information to the contrary. Now, as I often say, the devil is in the details. See, the question should not be whether the owner of a vehicle is likely to be the driver, but whether an owner with a suspended license is likely to drive anyway. Now, as Mrs. Harrington, the uh, lawyer for Mr. Glover said, quote, here, the only fact that would give rise to suspicion of illegal activity is the identity of the driver. 
and it was Kansas's burden to establish that the officer had reason to suspect that Mr. Glover was driving, but the officer stipulated that, actually, he had no idea who was driving. Now, most of the questions from the justices focused on whether or not the owners of vehicles tend to be the drivers of vehicles. Put another way, they came with the assumption that someone with a suspended license would commit the crime of driving without a valid license, even though they had no actual evidence to that effect. They assumed the owner of the vehicle is guilty until he or she is proven innocent. Does that mean that because my daughter drives a car registered in my name, she should be pulled over by every law enforcement officer that sees her on the road if just because I may have a problem with my record? As we've already stated, the reason the states are so interested is, quote, the decision below undermines the ability of state officers to keep their streets safe. This jeopardizes the lives of lawful drivers, passengers, and pedestrians everywhere. Accordingly, amici states have a substantial interest in the court's disposition of the case. Well, I agree, the states do have a substantial interest. You see, the states that filed the amicus brief claim that interest is because, in their opinion, it could jeopardize the lives of others. What they don't seem to show any interest in is the rights of those lawful drivers, the passengers or the pedestrians that they seem to be so concerned with. Now, we do expect police to do what they can to keep us safe. But if we are willing to give up our rights of that perceived safety, we don't really deserve either, do we? As Benjamin Franklin said, they who would give up essential liberty for temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. The third question we need to consider is that of burden of proof. You see, in this case, the deputy had a report of a person with a suspended license. The stop was not based on the actions of the driver, but the supposition that it was likely that the owner was the driver, all without any real basis or evidence to back up that supposition. Shouldn't reasonableness be based on the actions of the person in question, in this case, the driver? and not on who government agents think might or might not be driving the car? Chief Justice Roberts doesn't seem to think so. Quote, We know somebody's already broken the law in some sense. He's got a suspended license. I think it's probably more likely than not that he would break the suspended license. Now, as Ms. Harrington would later point out, the deputy did not know why Mr. Glover's license was suspended. So could not assume that he had already broken the law and neither should Chief Justice Roberts. See, without further evidence, there is no reason to believe that someone with a suspended license would continue to drive. Therefore, the stop, based solely on the state of the license of the registered owner, is not reasonable. If there was further evidence, had the deputy run the record of the owner and found that reasonable suspicion that they would be driving on a suspended license, or after checking the owner's photo against who he saw in the driver's seat believed it could be Mr. Glover. Even observing a minor traffic violation that normally would not initiate a stop, then and only then would the deputy have reasonable cause to initiate a stop. You may be asking why make such a big deal over a little traffic stop? Because little problems tend to grow into big ones. Does an officer have reasonable cause to stop every person driving a Toyota? simply because there was a report that one was used in a robbery? Or does the officer have to have additional information about the driver before they're allowed to make the stop? The fact that the owner of a vehicle has a suspended license is not evidence that a crime was committed, only opportunity. This may warrant further investigation, but does that include stopping someone with no evidence that a crime was even committed? What if a court has ordered that a person stay 100 feet away from their spouse? Who happens to live in a house owned by that person? Does that give an officer probable cause to enter a house any time they see fit? Because common sense says that most homes are occupied by their owners. Does the fact that there is opportunity for the person to commit a crime mean your rights are no longer matter? Do you really want to live in a country? where the mere belief that a crime is possible is enough for you to be stopped and your property searched. Are you really willing to give up all of your liberty for the false promise of a little bit of safety? 
So what do you think? Do you think Mr. Glover has a point? Or do you think the states have a point? Do you think it's reasonable to pull every vehicle over that happens to be owned by someone with a suspended license because, well, they may be driving? Or do you think there is a duty to investigate farther? Think about it this way. Does that mean if you have an issue with your license, if you have unpaid parking tickets, or some other situation where your license is suspended, does that mean anyone driving your car is free game to be searched anytime the person wants? This is a situation where I think the courts in the state of Kansas got it right. The simple fact that a vehicle is owned by someone with a suspended license is not carte blanche to allow that vehicle to be pulled over anytime a law enforcement officer sees it. A lot of the debate devolved around what officers common sense know, what they presume. Well, common sense isn't necessarily reasonable cause. If it were, we'd have a lot of reasonable cause to do a lot of different things in Washington. But while this is just a traffic stop, the idea behind it, that any time somebody has any legal engagement, their rights are gone, that their Fourth Amendment rights disappear, that should scare you. Because if you can be pulled over because the person who owns the vehicle you're driving happens to have a suspended license, what happens when they simply say, hey, I'm worried that, well, you may be dangerous to somebody and you have a gun or well you may be dangerous to somebody and you have a car see rights are rights and while the states have an interest in keeping people safe that does not supersede their duty to protect the rights of their citizens and that is where the problem is the state of kansas along with the other states that filed a brief, want the authority to ignore your rights if there's any legal or traffic inv question involved. And that should scare each and every American. So I hope this opened your eyes to something, maybe made you think a little bit more. I hope you found it interesting enough that you will head over to the website, constitutionstudy.com, uh, keep involved in what we're doing here, sign up for the newsletter. Just click that button. You can sign up for the newsletter. If you'd like me to come speak to one of your groups, click that button and ask. We'll see what we can do. Most of all, share this video, share the article, share the information so the people know what's going on in their states and come back and visit us next time at the Constitution Study. One thing you have to know wherever you make your stand Came from a long